We're in week number four of this series, Love Jones, and we've been teaching through the hottest song in Scripture, the Song of Solomon, and today we're going to talk about a very, very important subject. We're going to look at conflict resolution, because no matter who you are or how great your romance is, at some point in your relationship, you will disagree. You will have a conflict. I am extremely blessed and have been blessed to have a marriage that is beyond anything I could have ever expected a marriage to be. And my children would be the first to tell you that the number of times they saw their parents argue, fight, or disagree over their entire lives has been very scarce. But from time to time, we do disagree a life with each other and commitment to each other do not erase differences in personality, opinion, ideas, or past experiences. And therefore, disagreement is normal and natural. If I say normal and natural. In fact, I like to remind people that if two of you agree on everything, one of you is unnecessary. See, conflict is inevitable. Resolution is not. All couples disagree, and sometimes over the silliest things. All couples disagree, but healthy couples fight fair, whereas unhealthy couples fight dirty. Healthy couples work towards resolution, while unhealthy couples work to win. I win, you lose, not realizing that if one person wins, they both lose. All couples disagree. That's the testimony of the text today because here the two lovebirds we've been tracking who couldn't keep their hands off each other, who flooded each other with compliments, who fended off together the foxes that attempted to ruin their vineyard, here in the text they get into a little tiff. Look at verse 2 again. It is the woman speaking first, no surprise there, and say... I'm sorry, did I say something? Okay, she says, she says, I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my beloved is knocking. She is restless because he's not there. He was supposed to be there. He had promised to be there, but she hadn't seen him nor heard from him. She's halfway asleep, but not all the way sleeping. Her heart is awake. He finally knocks on the door and says in the latter part of verse 2, open the me, my beloved, my darling, my flawless one. Wait, it's past midnight. And just for the record, any time a man shows up at your door after midnight and opens with my darling, my dove, my flawless one, something is on his mind. Can we be that honest? In fact, after midnight, there's only one thing on his mind. Come think about it all the time. (laughs) Okay, but he finally shows up. Some of y'all still ain't got it, amen. But, But he finally shows up, and he's in the mood for romance. He says to her, my head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of night. Now permit this picture to flash on the screen of your mind. He rolls up in his chariot with 24s. It's after midnight. He knocks on the door. Now, quick review in case you missed it. In week one, remember she said, strengthen me with raisins. And we told you what raisins were. They were an ancient aphrodisiac. And then she says to him, his left arm is under my head and his right arm embraces me. They're in a tender and romantic position. In week number two, she said, until the day breaks and the shadows flee, turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle, like a young stag on the rugged hills. Translate, I want you all night long. And what do stags do on the hills at night? Climb, baby, climb. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
see, but week number three, week number three, and I'm going to try and say this with a straight face, but you read it in the text. She said, blow on my garden. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choicest fruit. She says, my beloved is mine and I am here. So he rolls up on his chariot. He finally shows up and he's expecting some romance. And yet in verse three, she responds, I've taken off my robe. Must I put it on again? I've washed my feet. Do I have to get them dirty again? Let me translate the Hebrew. It's very delicate and very complex. I got a bad headache. Go somewhere and sit down. Now, those are not the exact words, but that is the exact meaning. He's in the mood. She's tired, agitated, frustrated because she was waiting around and ended up worn out. He says, Romeo is here. She replies, Juliet is not. What does that spell? Conflict. Now, quickly, this interaction demonstrates for us two huge causes of conflict. Let me share them. And the first is unmet expectations. Would you say that with me? Unmet, Unmet expectations. See, in every relationship, some more than others, there will be unmet expectations. Often expectations are unmet because they are undeclared. A couple assumes but never asserts what they expect as the relationship continues. And it happens here in this text. She's expecting him to show up earlier, but he doesn't show up until later. She's asleep, but really awake. She's looking at her sundial and it's not moving because the sun went down a long time ago. Where is he? He didn't call. He didn't text. He didn't send a courier pigeon. You can almost hear the pretender singing in the text. It's five o'clock in the morning and I'm just getting it. Y'all know the song. Okay. It's a thin line. Yeah, y'all do know it. See, he finally shows up and he's remembering their previous interaction when she said, I want you all night long. And in that text where he was talking about her twin fawns and he's wondering, is the petting zoo open? But it's not. Ain't nothing going on but the rent. Amen. He wants something she doesn't. So on both sides, watch what's happening. There are unmet expectations. Listen. Listen, in any long-term relationship, you will see this in a number of ways. You won't make it past two weeks before unmet and undeclared expectations began to emerge. You're in a relationship and she's thinking, my father fixed everything in the house. He took the trash out without being asked. He paid all the bills and this guy doesn't know how to fix squat. He doesn't take the car to get it fixed and he had the nerve to ask me to deposit my check in our joint account so we could pay the bills together. How do you spell tension? He's looking at her and he's thinking, my mama cooked every day and like creation, it was good and very good. She can't boil water without burning it. We've eaten takeout 13 of the last 14 days and she keeps squeezing and the toothbrush from toothpaste from the bottom and putting the tissue on the wrong side of the roll and uh, turning it all around. I thought we were going to do this. How are we supposed to work through this? Or she thought you'd be praying every morning and doing Bible study together to grow spiritually while he thought she's going to sit beside me and watch Monday night football and go get my chicken wings and my nachos. Both of them are confused dazed and disappointed. He thought there would be more sex. She thought there would be more romance. He thought there would be more support. She thought there would be more conversation. But all they've got is unmet expectations and rising anxiety. And when kids enter the equation, things become even more complicated. The days pass. The years pass. And before you know it, you're seven years in and you're starting to itch. You're barely getting along. You're scarcely holding on. And you're thinking, well, maybe we should stay together for the sake of the kids. 
but you're little more than roommates sharing the bills and tolerating each other, distant from each other, and slowly realizing that you're not the husband, you're not the wife that you thought you would be, and you don't have the husband, and you don't have the wife that you thought you would have unmet expectations. That's number one. But number two is this, self-centeredness. Notice Solomon comes in and it's all about him. Me, Tarzan, you, Jane, let's swing on this vine together. He's Marvin Gaye. Get up, get up, get up, wake up, wake up. Let's make love tonight. The buttons on the ma that microwave have been pushed. But she says, I'm tired. I done took off my robe and my slippers. Notice that both of them are thinking only about their own needs. Neither one of them are thinking about the other person. I want this and you want that. We both have a problem. It is self-centeredness. And hear me, this can happen in a relationship in any number of ways. She wants to talk. You want to chill. She wants to connect. You want to watch television. Or maybe one person wants to be physically intimate and the other person does it. And slowly the tension begins to simmer. Or she goes shopping and he's thinking, you need another purse? Who needs seven purses and she's thinking well every time there's something new you upgrade your technology you upgraded it 50 seconds ago and I got right here in my drawer iPhone 1, 2, 3, 4, 5S, 5C and 6 with the big screen and then you fight about money you spent what? It's self-centeredness it's all about what I want and it works both ways you never do what I want you are all always thinking about yourself. Can I tell you something? Selfishness will suck the life out of any relationship. I ought to have a big amen right there. See, but I do need to drop my kickstand for a minute and tell you that if you're dating somebody now and you're fighting and arguing all the time, that is not a good sign. Sometimes when people are dating and they're arguing quite a bit, somebody will get the bright idea if we just get Mary, things will be better. Wah, wrong. Or somebody will say, let's have a baby together, believing that's going to make things better. Look at your neighbor and just say, wah. <clears throat> Or if you're already broke and somebody says, let's go to Hawaii on vacation. We could just charge it on the American Express, believing it. I don't make it better. It will for 30 days until the bill comes. See, if you're already arguing and fighting, <clears throat> that's a warning signal. It's an indicator that you may not be compatible on a number of levels. When you're dating, that's a time of growth and acquaintance and interaction, not just with each other, but with family, friends, and networks. It should not be a battleground. Tap somebody, say, I know that's right. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about what is the largest root cause of tension in your relationships. Is it unmet expectations where you want your partner to think, feel, do, and be something that they are not thinking, feeling, being, or doing? And as a result, you're battling bitterness and upset and irritability. Is it unmet expectations or is it really just self-centeredness? I want what I want when I want it. How I want it like I want it and that's it because if you go back to verse 3 she doesn't want to be bothered but then in verse 4 she suddenly wants him wait it's right there in the text for no explainable reason she says my beloved thrust his hand through the latch opening my heart began to pound for him verse 3 she doesn't want anything to do with him verse 4 she's excited to see him now this perplexed me so I did deep theological research search to try and figure out what was going on and this is what I came up with a woman always has the right to change her mind and she ain't got to give you no reason I should have had a better amen right there 
but I understand you change your mind. Amen. See, she, she didn't want him, and then she did. But as you read this, what I want you to see are the issues that irritate us in relationships do not have to be large or sizable. Sometimes it's the small issues that can work the most havoc and do the most damage. I want to be on time, and you're running late, so you're inconsiderate. I bought something, and I didn't tell you. You can't be trusted. I did something wrong, but didn't apologize for it. You don't care. Don't miss that. That something very small, if left unattended and unchecked, can become something very large. When we're fighting, we think our partner is the enemy. Your partner is never the enemy. We do not battle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities of this dark world. Our partner is not the enemy. We need to be on the same side of the table, not fighting for victory, but fighting for resolution. And if we leave something small unchecked, it can grow into something devastating over time. Let me try and help you. This couple had a fight in the text. How do we resolve our differences? Well, some people shift the blame. Look at your neighbor, say ancient strategy. Yeah, it started with Adam and Eve. You remember when Adam and Eve fell, when they sinned in the garden? Adam took it like a man and blamed the woman. When God showed up in the garden, he said, Lord, the woman you gave me, she made me eat that forbidden fruit. Some people shift the blame. Other people escalate the argument that what begins as a slight disagreement when they see that they're losing becomes a full-scale blowout where anything is said and you have to be careful with your words because once they are released they cannot be retrieved and words have power Proverbs 18 21 life and death are in the power of the tongue Galatians 5 15 if you bite and devour each other watch out or you will be destroyed by each other words have power some people escalate the argument some people shift the blame Others become intensely critical. This is what Dr. John Gottman of the University of Washington called one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. He says in any relationship, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. That across years of research, he reported you can track the relational breakdown between a couple by simply observing how they handle conflict. When those four elements appear in their conflict, danger is imminent, for as each horseman arrives, he paves the way for the next one. He says complaining is different than criticizing, because complaining is a healthy marital activity. Airing a complaint, though rarely pleasant, makes the relationship stronger in the long run than surprising pressing the complaint. Conflict creates the fire of affect and emotions. And every fire has two aspects, one of burning and one of giving light. That's Carl Hume. But complaining is different than criticizing because criticism involves attacking somebody's personality rather than their behavior. And as a result, or as a general rule, criticism entails blaming, making a personal attack or accusation, while a complaint is a negative comment about something you wish were otherwise. Complaints usually begin with the word I, whereas criticisms usually begin with the word you. And the problem with criticism is that it leads to contempt. And contempt will poison a relationship. What separates contempt from criticism is that contempt, when you begin to move in contempt, you have the intent to insult and psychologically or emotionally abuse your partner. When contempt appears, it overwhelms the relationship and eventually blocks out every positive feeling that partners have for each other. And some of the most common expressions of contempt are name calling, hostile humor, mockery. And once they have entered, the relationship goes from 
bad to worse. Contempt usually leads to defensiveness. And defensiveness is so destructive that it eventually becomes a reflex where the victim reacting instinctively doesn't see anything wrong with being defensive, but defensiveness tends to escalate a conflict rather than resolve it. And defensiveness leads to stonewalling. Now, you may not have heard that term, and let me tell you quick that men are, most of the stonewallers are men because feeling overwhelmed by the emotional content of an argument, they start withdrawing by presenting a stonewall response. They keep their faces straight. They keep their eyes immobile. They avoid eye contact. They hold their necks rigid. They avoid nodding their head or making the small sounds that would indicate to anybody who was alive that they were listening. See, stonewallers often claim, I'm just not trying to make things worse, so I ain't going to say nothing, not realizing that stonewalling itself conveys disapproval, icy distance, and a sense of smugness, and is a form of disrespect that I don't even respect you enough to engage in this conversation. See, unresolved, unhandled conflict acts as a cancer that erodes the passion, intimacy, and commitment of a relationship. Couples who do not make an issue of things often bury those things and manifest what I call anger substitutes because they are not dealing directly with their real emotions. And so when something bad is going on. They will overeat, they'll get depressed, they'll gossip, they'll drink a little bit too much of the wrong thing, they'll smoke a little bit of the too much of the wrong thing, they'll suffer physical illness, or they'll do things to get back at their partner in a hundred small ways. I heard a priceless story about this subject. A woman, her and her husband were arguing and she asked her husband, been one morning to zip up the back of her dress. He began to play around with the zipper just to irritate her, zipping it up and down and up and down. And in the process, the zipper broke. She had just had the dress dry clean and was already late for a job interview. And there she stood with a broken dress. She was furious. About 5.30 that evening, she returned home still angry. She put her car in the garage and noticed her husband working on his car lying underneath it from the waist up, the lower part of his body sticking out and temptingly accessible. To get back at him, she reached down and grabbed the zipper on the front of his jeans and began to zip it up and down just as he had done her dress that morning. And then when it got caught, she stopped and walked in the house. However, to her astonishment, her husband was standing in the kitchen. She said, how did you get in here so quick? He said, huh? She said, two seconds ago, you were under the car. He said, no, I haven't been under the car at all. She said, well, somebody's out in the garage under that car. He said, oh, that's the next door neighbor. He said, my muffler came loose, and he volunteered to fix it. His wife's face turned red as she admitted to her husband, what she had done, and they both heard it out to apologize, but found the guy lying totally still. They called him, but he didn't respond. So they pulled him out by his legs. He was knocked out cold. Then when he came to, they discovered that he had done what any man would have done if somebody grabbed the zipper to his pants and zipped it up and down till it got caught. When she started zippering, he was under the car, sat straight up, and bam, hit his head on the underside of the car so hard that he knocked himself out. Moral of the story, sometimes in giving people a taste of their own medicine, you make yourself sick. you got to leave it and them in the hands of Almighty God. 
See, how do we resolve our differences? Let me give you three quick principles to work on. Three promises that if applied will be transformative in terms of how you relate to each other and grow in grace. How do we resolve conflict? Say this with me. I will respond, not react. See, when we have conflict, not if, but when there's a conflict, say to yourself, I will respond by the Spirit instead of reacting in the flesh. Look at your neighbor and say, all of us got to work on that. See, rather than barking and growling and cussing and hollering and screaming or trying to offer a comeback, pause for a moment and let the Spirit of God lead you in responding rather than reacting according to how you feel at that given time. That's what Solomon appears to do in the text. His expectation was not met, but rather than reacting in anger and bitterness. Watch this. It's a wonderful example. He put a little bit of love oil on the doorknob as an act of empathy. I'm not making it up. It's in verse 5. She didn't open the door for him, and after she changed her mind, she got up to open the door, but he was gone. But verse 5 says, I arose to open for my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh on the handles of the boat. When she refused his advance, he didn't force his way in. He didn't get rambunctious. He just put a little myrrh on the doorknob and left. Romans chapter 12, verse 21, Paul said, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What are we to do? Everybody say, Overcome evil with good. Come on, say it a little louder. Say, Overcome evil with good. Amen. Now, if evil is sitting right next to you, just say it out loud anyway. Overcome evil with good. Amen. See, why is it, my friends, that in our relationships, when we are being attacked, often to defend ourselves, we criticize the other person? Think logically with me for a moment. What other relationship anywhere in the world ever gets better with criticism? None. Think about it. If you go to work tomorrow and your boss criticizes you all day long, are you going to go home and say, I feel so much closer to my boss. He criticized me all day long. No, it's going to create distance and evoke harm in the relationship. If your best friend criticizes you all day long, he or she will not be your best friend for long. And yet in many of our relationships, and especially in marriage, we tend to think that criticizing one another is actually going to make things better. It does not. It makes things worse. Well, what are we to do, Pastor? His suggestion, compliment sometime rather than criticizing all the time. Go on, tap somebody and say, whoop, there it is. Amen. See, you got to choose your battles carefully because love may be blind, but it is not unconscious. Couples are virtually certain to break up when they cannot find a relaxed, reasonable, efficient way of figuring out how to settle their differences. And notice, when you read the Bible, the scriptures never instruct us to change each other. We're in Encourage to pray for each other, encourage each other, support each other, love each other. Wait, change is God's job. Tap your neighbor and say, stay in your lane. You can't change anybody. You need God's help just to change yourself. We are never told to change anybody, and yet you will be amazed at how much time and energy we invest trying to do just that. In a relationship, we are told to love each other not be harsh with each other, to respect each other, and not demean each other, to be considerate of each other, to cherish each other, to submit to each other in love, but never to change each other because that's God's job. I've got a suggestion. Instead of trying to change them, why don't you change the one thing you can? Let God change you. Pray for them, and what's powerful is this. Your prayer may not change them, but but your prayer always changes you and most of the time changes things. See, do not react.
react in the flesh, respond in the spirit. Sometimes you have to give it up and let God have it before you make it worse. But here's number two, focus on the good, not the bad. Paul said in Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That means focus on the good and not the bad. Don't dwell on downers. If you are having a fight about how much time your partner is spending at work, I promise you it will not advance your argument if you also note that he or she is overdrawn at the bank and always leaves the car with no gas in the tank. You got to work to stick to the issue at hand. Define the issue clearly. Don't jump to a new issue until the first issue is resolved. Don't use all or nothing type language. If you get off course, refocus your exchange. Talk about it later. When you're, un when you're upset or unhappy, every spat can turn into a slippery slope where unkind words lead to more unkind words. Make up your mind that you're going to give up Put downs. That's tweetable right there. I know you remember the childhood saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Help your neighbor say, that's an all out lie right there. Amen. Yeah, words hurt. Names hurt. And somebody here can testify. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who are experts at character assassination. But in Ephesians 4.29, the Bible says, let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption, but let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander and malice be put away from you. Focus on the good and not on the bad. I love what Ruth Graham said about Billy Graham who at one point in his career traveled for seven months out of every year. A reporter asked Ruth, doesn't that make you sick that your husband is always gone? He's always on the road. She could have easily said, yes, it's very difficult. He's never at home. But do you know what she said? She said, sir, five months with Billy is better than 12 months with anybody else. See, that's focusing on the good. That's counting your blessings. In fact, that's what this Shulamite woman did. If you read on, she starts to think about him, and she describes all the features of her husband that she likes, she adores, and she admires. She starts to think about all of his good qualities. And here's the challenge, my friends. No matter who you're with, they will not live. You got to settle this in your spirit. They will not live up to 100% of your expectations, not now, not never. It is impossible. No human being is going to meet 100% of your needs. Only God can meet every need. I ought to have five people who just say only God. Amen. See, so if you want 100% and they give you 80%, you ought to shout every single day. You ought to wake up in the morning with a shout on your tongue. See, if they give you 80%, there's still 20% missing, and here's what so many people tragically do. They see that 20% in somebody else, so they give up their 80% going for the 20%, not knowing that when you get over there, they missing 80% of what you see, only to be incredibly dissatisfied because you have no idea how good you already have it. That's why I say to people, don't spend a whole lot of time, you know, years mourning over somebody who left you. If she took him from you, goodbye, good riddance, and you are in my prayers because you're going to need them. Amen. Do not look for the good. Do not trade the 80% for the 20%. 
I will respond by the spirit, not react in the flesh. I'll focus on the good and not the bad. And number three, this is the toughest one. I will talk and not walk. If Solomon did something right, it was not forcing his way in. If he did something wrong, it was leaving while there was still an issue going on. For my entire life, including this moment in which I stand, I believe this principle that I'm about to share with you. You can't fix being together by being apart. Oh, you ought to write that down. See, don't run from strife. Don't allow yourself to bury something that irritates you because repressed irritations have a high rate of resurrection. Paul said in Ephesians 4.26, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil, I like this phrase, a foothold. Don't give the devil a place. Go on, tap your neighbor, say, shake the devil off. Amen. See, look, that word foothold in the text is translated loosely guest room. What he's saying is don't give the devil a guest space in your life. Don't let him in your relationship. Don't go to bed angry. Even if you can't work it out, agree not to be angry about it, but just to pray about it until the next day. Talk it out. Don't walk it out because every couple fights, but how we fight fight will determine the strength and durability of our relationship. So say to yourself, I will not react. I will respond. I will focus on the good and not on the bad. I will talk and not walk. Because notice what happens to Solomon and his wife. He shows up. They make up. And then he has a great line in this text. It's Song of Solomon chapter 6 verse 5. He says, turn your eyes away from me because they overpower me. Here's what happens. Their relationship went from good to not so good to better to way better. And look at chapter 6 verse 11. He then says, I went down to the grove of the nut trees to look at the new growth in the valley. What did he go to look at? New growth. Everybody saying new growth. See, as you work together as a couple to resolve conflict, you must find a solution that is good for you, good for your partner, and good for your spiritual life. And as I teach today, I'm aware some of you may be in a place that is not good. But I say to you, with the help of the Holy Spirit and through the power of Christ, what this text reminds us is that there can always be new growth because in Christ, he he makes all things new. He can give you something better than you could ever ask, think, or imagine. No matter what your past has been, Jesus can fix your future. Yes, he can. Let me try and explain it this way. The story is told of a young woman who had gotten delivered from a very, very rough, painful, and tragic past. She accepted Christ. She joined the church. She became very involved in the ministry, and after a while, she caught the eye and the heart of the pastor's only son. Their relationship blossomed, and they became engaged. And once their engagement became public, people began to voice their opinion and an objection to the woman with her past being set up to marry the pastor's only son. And finally, as often is the case in some churches, they decided to have a church meeting to settle the issue. People came, tensions were high, arguments were made, and the meeting got completely out of hand. And as the young woman listened to them talk about her past, she began to cry until finally the pastor's son stood stood up to speak. He said, I want to challenge every one of you today to think carefully about what is happening here because it is not my fiance's past that is on trial. He said, what's on trial in this room today is the blood of Jesus. He said, what you are really questioning is whether the blood of Jesus can wash away sin. And today the blood is on trial. And I just want to know before we leave, 
what is your verdict does the blood of Jesus wash away sin or not and when he said that tears welled up in the eye of every believer in that auditorium the whole church began to weep as they realized what they had been doing because they too had a past they too had made mistakes they too had fallen short but the blood had cleansed them the blood had saved them the blood had changed them and I would dare say that's true of somebody here because nobody here is perfect we have all made mistakes we have all fallen short we have all missed the mark but thank God for the blood of Jesus it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley the blood gives me strength from day to day and it will never lose its power the blood still works what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus if it's broke he can fix it if it's lost he can find it if it's shattered he can put it back together the blood still works 